So it's my absolute pleasure now to introduce Emily Ailes. Now, Emily completed a Bachelor of Applied Science for Human Movement, has worked at Navita in various roles. Um, she became the Recreation Officer for Navita's new Connectability Service, which was a pilot project funded by the Office of Rec and Sport Inclusive Recreational Inclusive Sport Program. Um, whilst working there, she's also done work with the Australian Paralympic Committee, firstly to deliver the Skill Development Program, and then became a part-time development officer to develop para sport opportunities in SA. Please welcome Emily. Thanks Ali. Um, we're just sorting out the clicker but um, there's a lot of information I'm going to get through so what I'm aiming to do today is to provide you with a reference of um, places to find the information with more detail. So um, So um, obviously disability sport classification, what are the differences? Um, and I'm sort of calling it from the street to compete. Hopefully we're all good now. Thank you. Yep, no worries. Okay, so um, as I said, what are the sporting options and pathways available for people with um, so, this is an old reference. Um, some people may have heard of it. It's cool. It's a it's a story that a mother of a child with a disability wrote many many years ago, and it just gives a really good analogy of what it's like um, to have a to, to have a child with a disability. And I say, you know, born with a disability. So. It's um, go, I won't go into it because it's a little bit long, but, um, and feel free to take photos of the screens because there's lots of links up there. I'll put them deliberately so you can look at them later. Um, so it's preparing for a baby um, with the analogy of um, you're making, planning a trip to Italy and you learn the language, you look at the reference books, you get your Lonely Planet out and then you're on the plane and then the hostess says, welcome to Holland. And you're like, whoa. So it's a really good analogy. Um, that lots of our parents face. Um, and as Ali said, at, I'm from Novita, there's a pamphlet in, your, um, in the packs which explains what our services are, so I won't go into those details today, but that just goes to our mission and our vision. So, Connectability is a service that we provide. Um, it is funded in, with the NDIS, so it's a service that I provide to our clients at Novita. Um, it's basically, it's a supportive and practical link-up service between young people with disabilities in the community, sporting and recreation groups, so helping break down barriers. And I do that by, sort of, the assessment is a question and answer. So. Um, as, um, as we've heard earlier today, just having that conversation, finding out their interests um, and what they might have tried before, what's worked, what hasn't worked. And then we, um, I provide a, it's a individualised support package of where to find those activities that they've um, indicated that they're interested in. And then I, part of my role as well is to promote inclusive come and try activities um, that we have. So, I've had, had involvement with, um, with SACA over the years as well, with providing some cricket opportunities, some soccer opportunities. Um, so you can come and find me if you want um, your, you know, an inclusive sport um, participant. So that's another thing that I do. Um, and as I said, it's individualised um, with expert support. So the expert support is the therapists that I work with. So we work with physios, occupational therapists, um, speech pathologists, psychologists, social workers, um, family service coordinators, um, and we have a big research department as well. So that's what I can tap into with this service, which makes it a bit unique um, to compared to some other services. So the I'm going to go through. Um, this part is the classification. So when I talk about classification, this part is um, 
the International Paralympic Committee classification eligibility and, I guess, criteria. Um, and then later on, I'll go into path, international pathways for other impairments, which may not be linked to the Paralympics. So the best way to describe it is this short video from the IPC put out. In the Paralympic Games, the classification system is essential as it defines which athletes can compete in which sports. Athletes are divided into classes based on how their impairment affects them on the field of play in order to allow fair competition. If you're new to classification, it can help to think of why men almost always compete against men and women almost always compete against women. Or think of it in similar terms to how boxing at the Olympic Games works, where athletes compete in different weight categories, like flyweight or heavyweight. As each sport at the Paralympic Games requires different skills and competencies, the impact of impairments on the performance of the athletes varies. That's why each sport has its own unique classification rules. Some sports feature a wide variety of impairments, in both athletics and swimming, athletes with physical, visual and intellectual impairments compete. Other sports feature fewer types of impairment. For example, only athletes with a visual impairment take part in judo and five-a-side football at the games. Athletics has the most number of classes due to the number of different running, jumping and throwing events and the wide variety of athletes that can compete in the sport. In contrast, shooting only has two classes. Each athlete competing at the Paralympic Games has already gone through an evaluation to determine their class. This evaluation is conducted by authorised technical officials called classifiers, who are appointed by the International Federation for that sport. This is a long-term, ongoing process which takes place at all major events, before and during competition. It ensures that the athletes are confident they are competing against each other on a level playing field. Classification won't get in the way of your enjoyment as a spectator and will also help you further appreciate the ability and the performance of the athletes. The Paralympics is not about the impairments. It's all about elite sport. Let the games begin. Okay, so that, hopefully that was a really good snapshot of um, what Paralympic classification looks like. Um, each sport has its own classification system, so I'm just going to try and um, direct you to find some information about this. So the Australian Paralympic Committee um, have put together a, um, a really good um, YouTube, they've got an own YouTube channel. Um, called the Australian Paralympic Team, and on there, I'm not, I haven't got time to show you the videos. There's a whole, there's about 18 videos on there, and what is Paralympic sport? There is a fantastic video that explains what um, sport is, and then you can go into the individual videos as well of what um, each, like you know, they've got para swimming, athletics, um, cycling, they've got all the winter and summer sports available there to have a, um, a look at. So I'm not sure how many people have come across some of the um, classifications and they all have a number. So each sport has a code which I, to identify which classification the athlete is competing in and, um, and what event. So for example, in athletics, it's a, it might be a T36 or a F36 
would be, um, and so T it means track, F means um, field, and the 30s um, indicates that your impairment is cerebral palsy. So that is just for athletics. Each sport has its own classification system. So um, other, some sports classification is determined purely on diagnosis, as I said, with athletics and some is determined by how the impairment affects the movement, um, for example, swimming. Um, generally, very generally speaking, the lower the number after that letter indicates the high level of impairment. So in swimming, a S9 athlete has sort of more um, physical or ability than an S1 swimmer. Um, that is very generally speaking. So boccia is the sport that I'm a um, technical classifier in and that doesn't quite follow those rules. So as I said, it's very generally speaking. Um, this for vision impairment, athletes with a vision impairment, they see got their eligibility is um, through medical sort of um, assessments through an ophthalmologist. So they have a class B1, B2 or B3 and then that's translated into those um, winter, sorry, into the um, vision impaired sports. And I'll put the links on the bottom of each of these. There's a really good fact sheet on this um, APC website. So that first one was for vision impaired, just in case. Um, and then the next, this is all on the classification page of the APC website. Um, intellectual impairment, uh, the athletes need to have a, a um, score of 75 or less on an internationally recognised and professionally administered um, IQ test before the age of 18. So as I said, this is for Paralympic Games and there's a fact sheet there as well. And then the third category is physical impairment. Um, it's the largest group of athletes and represented in Paralympic sport and there's a really good fact sheet on, um, on the APC website about that. So this is a general classification fact sheet um, on eligibility. So it sort of go it goes through what the impairment is, how it's affected, whether it's muscle power or, you know, reduced um, range of movement, and then supporting medical documentation. So who do you need to see to get that, um, to get that eligibility criteria? So it goes through all the impairments, and then, um, then we come to the <laughs> tricky bit. So, we all know in South Australia, we haven't, and even across Australia, we haven't got the numbers. You know, at Paralympic Games, you've got all of those athletes with that, um, that classification racing against each other. Whereas if you're having at a school event and you still want to have a school event athletics, then it's called multi-class. So this is, this is a way that you can have multiple classifications so you're not just having a single person running by themselves. So in athletics, they use a multi-disabled standards table and that provides a percentage of their, um, their score. So it's been developed to determine who is going to be the winner. So for this example, I've got the green there, F20. That is an athlete with an intellectual disability. Um, and this is an example of women's discus. They, they've come third even though they have thrown the longest distance. That's because for their impairment, they got their result, percentage result, is less than the, who is at F36, which is a cerebral palsy athlete who has thrown a shorter distance, but it's a higher percentage in their class. This is probably <laughs> really confusing, but um, you can just put in the data and it works it out for you. So, um, and then in swimming, they have the user point score system. So, it's the same thing, it's just a Excel spreadsheet, you put the data in. So at a, I've seen, you know, at, and Michael probably knows a lot more about this than I do, but at, um, at nationals, even for um, um, the Australian National Championships, the para swimming events, the race finishes, and then it might take a couple of minutes for the results to come up on who came first, not who touched the wall first. Yeah, oh, that's very quick now. <laughs> So um, where do we start? So the um, Paralympic Committee, the Australian Paralympic Committee has got a really good tool called Select a Sport. So you can select your impairment group um, 
and that means that vision impairment, um, you might have, yeah, it might be short stature or um, physical, so this is an example with vision impairment, um, and it, then it says, do you have vision affecting both eyes or is it vision affecting one eye? And then you've, if you clicked on yes, it affects both eyes, and then down the bottom there are the sports that you are eligible with a vision impairment. If you clicked on just one eye only, it, it sort of stops you there and says you may not be eligible for this particular sport. But that doesn't mean that you can't play up to even just a local level or state level for a, um, a sport like goalball, which is a vision impaired sport. Every, everyone wears um, blackout goggles. But um, to, to represent Australia in an international level, you need to have the eligible criteria. And then I'll just go through intellectual impairment. Physical impairment, as I said, it's the largest group. This one um, has a bit more detail because there's lots of different um, physical impairments. So this is an example of cerebral palsy or brain injury that affects, um, I've said that affects both arms and legs and um, all four limbs. And then select an option um, how, what your mobility is. So do you use a powered wheelchair everywhere? Are you able to walk short distances inside or are you able to walk longer distances outside? And then from that, you get a selection of sports available to you. And then you'll be able to click on those sports and then that shows you about that sport, how to get involved, um, and that's a, and who the National Federation is. This one is Boccia Australia, and then the local state federations. And that gives you a, um, a good starting point on where to go and where to start. This is um, Athletics Australia's, um, I guess, map of how to get involved. So you can see there's two pathways. Um, there's the school sporting pathways, and we're really lucky in SA that we've got um, School Sport SA are fantastic in promoting para-sporting events. And then you can go quite high up into that via the school pathway, but if you want to go further, you need to be in the, at the club level. But it's a great entry level, and classification is part of that process. Swimming has a um, pathway as well. And then you'll see that the non-Paralympic pathways at the top has their international pathways, but they're not Paralympic Games. So that means um, they do cater for people with a hearing impairment, um, Down syndrome and transplant. So this moves into the international pathways for various impairments. And I'll quickly go through these so I've put links on the bottom of all of these pages as well. So the Paralympic Games, probably the most familiar. Summer in winter, um, it's the same host city as the Olympic Games. There's the physical, intellectual and vision impairment that I mentioned earlier. It is for elite athletes. So there is an elite element to, these, to this, um, these sports. So lots of these athletes have scholarships with their um, state and then national sports institutes. Um, the International Federation is the IPC and then the Australian Paralympic Committee, national sporting organisations and state sporting organisations are the pathways into this. Special Olympics World Games is the international pathway for athletes with an intellectual disability. They have their summer and winter games. We just had the national games here in Adelaide in April. Um, and that is the, it's, you still have to have, I say, I say participation showcase celebrating disability, but you still have to have um, an eligibility criteria, a process um, to compete. It is serious competition. There's medals, so Sam earlier, no, sorry, yeah, um, no, Ben earlier today, he, he won some medals at this event, so it's fantastic, and the friendships and everything they get out of it is just, it's amazing. So, um, the Special Olympics also provides weekly sporting opportunities for pathways for regional, interstate and national and international events. I've put the Commonwealth Games in there because it was quite recent and I don't know how many of you would have seen a few para sports um, in, um, embedded into the event. So, yeah, it was, it was great, but it's, 
it's up to the host committee. So it was fantastic because Australia were hosting it. So the host committee determines which para sports. So for example, there's a picture of our um, South Australian athlete, Braden Davidson, who won a gold medal in Rio with the long jump. He didn't compete at the Commonwealth Games because his sport wasn't on the event list. So, because it's a much compressed, you can imagine it's quite a tight schedule. Um, so, you know, otherwise the Commonwealth Games will probably go for a long time. I know a lot of people are calling for, you know, every sport to be like that embedded. I think it'll be a logistical nightmare personally, but um, um, as we say, the Olympic Games is the warm-up event for the Paralympic Games, so. Um, INAS Global Games is for athletes with an intellectual impairment, and this is an elite pathway. Um, Sport Inclusion Australia, so Inclusive Sport SA is the national body and um, Inclusive Sport SA um, are involved with um, athletes on this journey. And then you have the state branches. Then we've got Deaf Olympics, so those are obviously for athletes with a hearing impairment and it is an elite um, pathway as well. And Deaf Sports Australia are the um, national body. Then World Dwarf Games, that is, again, is another participation showcase event. It's fantastic. It has a huge following. Um, Short Statured People of Australia is the national body, and then they have state branches. We don't actually have a state branch in South Australia, but we do have South Australian athletes who have travelled to the World Dwarf Games, um, and they compete in the numerous different sports. Um, World Transplant Games, as well as a participation showcase competition. They have summer and winter games. Um, and the eligibility criteria is life supporting allografts. So um, um, there's lots of, there, they have a really good list on their website um, of which, um, what makes them eligible. So the World Transplant Games Federation are the International Federation, and then we have Transplant Australia and the state branches that look after those athletes. And then the IPSA World Championships is the um, International Blind Sports Association. So obviously for um, vision impairment and it is another elite pathway. And Blind Sports Australia are the national federation and the um, state branches. So Blind Sports SA are the state branch that look after the sports there. So um, with IPSA and the INAS, they have additional sports that are not included in the Paralympic program. So, for example, um, IBSA has the um, blind cricket as well as the athletics. And an example for INAS is, um, I know they have, they have, there's only three sports in Paralympic, um, in the Paralympic Games that are eligible with intellectual disability. So the INAS has a more, of, more of those at their, um, in their international pathways. And then the last one um, is the trisomy games. So Down syndrome is the eligibility criteria for these athletes. And again, it's another participation showcase event. Um, but you obviously get um, athletes going across different, you know, if, if their sport is in Special Olympics, lots of these athletes are competing at Special Olympics, not just um, solely the trisomy games pathway. Um, and Down syndrome Australia are the national body for that. So I have ploughed really quickly <laughs> through so many of those, lots of information. Um, if there's any questions or neither now or if you want to come and find me, I will be here tomorrow as well as today. So um, I probably went through it very, very quickly, but um, Obviously, it's, you know, to create a fair competition and whether it's not just elite level, it's that school competition as well. That's what I really try to emphasise is that everyone's competing against other athletes in a fair race, whether it's for a school age competition or um, an international one. So. Autism spectrum, um, how do we build and integrate that into sport? That is um, a really new area and there's the, the hardest thing with autism spectrum disorder is um, the assessments 
to find, you know, if you've got someone with a low adaptive behaviour but they've got high intelligence or vice versa. Um, and aut autism spectrum disorder is probably the most prevalent impairment around. So there is a huge gap there um, that they're not catered for, but there is work in this, in this space and we are doing a research project at Novita around um, assessment for sports and things in this. So watch this space, I think, is gonna be the short answer to that. Yeah, the NDIS, and I think with our panellists this afternoon, they'll be able to um, share their personal experiences. So Caleb Croden is one of them. And um, the NDIS, as I said, it covers my time um, under Novita, and my role is just linking them into the appropriate um, recreation activities. In turn, I've had some NDIS, as you know, is very wide and varied in depends which planner you get. And I've had some clients who have got a sports chair funded through the NDIS and I've had other who can't even get their own chair sorted so it's really inconsistent but fingers crossed it gets better. Yeah. Uh, 